Welcome to the video ministry of the Cedar Hill Baptist Church in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, where we stand firmly upon the Word of God. Psalm 103, I'm going to read the first part of the psalm, and then we'll have a word of prayer and get into the message today. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. 
he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts upon the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Let's stop right there. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time we have here today. Lord, as we prepare our hearts this morning, Lord, I just ask that uh, we um, uh, delve into your word. May the Holy Spirit uh, teach us and guide us according to the scripture that you have given us. Lord, anoint my lips this morning to share that which you've laid upon my heart. And Lord, as we prepare for this uh, specific holiday week, Lord, may it be a good reminder of the, of the biblical principles that coincide with that. Lord, we thank you. We ask all this now in your precious name. Amen. I want to preach on having a, a heart of gratitude, and it is, uh, we're coming up this Thursday to Thanksgiving. Um, I have felt this way. Many of you have expressed this morning, I can't believe it's Thanksgiving already. You know, it's already here. It's already uh, upon us. We're already preparing for that, and as soon as Thanksgiving is over, we're deep into the Christmas season. I know Home Depot's been in Christmas mode for like three months already or something, right? It seems like they've had their trees up forever. Uh, but uh, for, the, for the bulk of us, you know, we'll get right into that. You'll start to see Christmas decorations here at the church as soon as next week. And so things move quick, uh, but we want to take a moment this morning and prepare our hearts uh, on, the, on the vein of Thanksgiving and the importance of gratitude. We had started in Psalm 100 as our scripture reading, and I want to I look at that for a minute. So if you have your Bibles open, probably just across the page there, Psalm 100 is a psalm used so often at Thanksgiving time as we talk about um, gratefulness and thankfulness and so forth. And in verse number four in particular, uh, we have this familiar passage within that chapter, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Uh, I heard a message a number of years ago on uh, the proper protocol to come before the Lord. So if we're coming before the Lord in prayer, uh, how do we do that? What's the proper way to do that? How do we conduct ourselves if we're going to come before his presence? God Almighty is our Father, and we have an open invitation to come before Him. At the same time, there is well due some reverence that should accord us as well as we come before the presence of the Lord. It's been a number of years ago now, um, but uh, as a local pastor, I was invited by our local state representative to go down to Harrisburg. Uh, to the House of Representatives for the state, state house, and uh, to open the state house session in prayer. And uh, was, uh, was our, uh, uh, Scott Perry was our local rep at the time. Obviously, he's in Washington now, but at the time, he was our local rep, and he invited me to go down. I got to spend about four or five hours at his office and with him and see what they do and then go over to the house as they opened and uh, have a word of prayer. And uh, in the midst of that, there's, there's protocol. That goes along with all that, right? Uh, um, believe it or not, uh, I was expected to dress appropriately. You know what I mean? You just can't wear, you know, I'm not, I'm not supposed to wear uh, my old blue jeans and a painting t-shirt. and You know, you're supposed to dress appropriately as you go there, of course. Um, there's a, um, I found out, and I, I didn't know all this, and, and some of the words have escaped me over the time, but um, there's, a, there's a lady who is really the one running the show. She's not one of the elected officials, but she knows what to do, where to be, who's running everything. Just like every major office in America, right? There's an office administrator, kind of like here at church sometimes, if you know what I mean. There's an office administrator that's really running everything behind the scenes, that knows where everybody's supposed to be and make sure everything's on time and make sure everything's done according to the plan. And they had this lady, and uh, uh, so Scott Perry took me to her. 
And she's like, this is where you're going to stand, and this is where you're going to sit. And when he does this, you're going to get up, and you're going to pray. And when you're, you know, when, when you're done, um, don't just leave, she said. When you're done, he's going to make a, an, an edict of some point. He's going to do all this with his gavel, and he's going to smack his gavel. And when he's done, he takes that gavel, and he gives it to you. That's a memento that you get to keep as you leave for the day. And then after that, they'll start business, and you leave, and you go out this door, and you go, okay, so I... The protocol, right? Stand here, do this, do that, don't leave too early, wear appropriate clothes, you know, do the right thing at the right time. There's protocol of how to go through the system at our local House of Representatives. I'm glad they, they, they told me, right? I'm glad they had a system in place so I didn't look like a bumbling idiot. I knew where to be and where to stand and when to, when to, when to leave and all that stuff, I'll do all that very appropriately. Um, the Bible gives us some protocol of how to come before the Lord. So we have an open invitation to come before the Lord in prayer. And Psalm 100 is one of those passages that gives us some protocol. Uh, verse 4, which we just read. I just read for you. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. One of those um, parts, and I, if you've heard, I've preached through this, I've preached on the, the subject of prayer, we've taught through a long courses on prayer. I believe a thankful heart and thanksgiving and praise should be a very important part, maybe the most important part, of our prayer life. And so to come with the right heart, not obviously we, we know this, I... Um, I've used phrases like this before. I think sometimes we view God and our prayer life. Let me put that, the prayer life part of our relationship with God. We view it almost as like an ATM machine. If we punch in the right code, what we want comes out. You know, if, if we say the right thing, if we say what, what we're supposed to say, then God will give us what we need. And we look at God as almost a give and get, which we've lost the focus on what our relationship with God is really all about. There should be an emphasis on thanksgiving and an emphasis on thanking and glorifying him. If you were in Sunday school this morning in Brother Walker's class, the emphasis was on glorifying God. That's the primary duty of man, and so that should be an emphasis in our prayer life. And so, as we come to Thanksgiving week, we're going to uh, probably, probably at some point, at some level, um, at a dinner table or something like that, there'll be an opportunity for people to say maybe what they're thankful for. Maybe in school, the children will have an opportunity. If you ask the kids, you know, I got... Um, uh, Branson and Mason, my, my little grandkids, and they're in elementary school. If you ask them what they're thankful for, it's going to be everything from, you know, a puppy to a pizza, right? You know, it's going to be those, those temporal things that are important to them at, at their age. They're going to be thankful for mom and dad and, and things like that. And Branson, who's a little older, will, after a minute, will say, oh, oh, oh and, and the Bible. Yes, right. As we get older, I think we still become kind of wrapped up in maybe the temporal things over the spiritual things. We're thanking God for our health and our job and our situation and our relationships. And the problem is if, if our health or our job or our relationship starts to fade, does our gratitude fade? Because they're tied to temporal things. Bible gives us, I think, some examples of the things we should be thankful for, things that are eternal, things that are spiritual, uh, things that won't fade away, no matter how I feel, no matter what my health may be, no matter my current location or situation, there are things that aren't going to change, and so my, my gratitude is tied to something more permanent. So Psalm 103 my text this morning, David begins to list some of those things. And so I'm just going to go down through the psalm and, and pull out a couple of things. Verse number three, 
Psalm 103, verse 3, he says in verse 1, bless the Lord. Verse 2, bless the Lord. Verse 3, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. He was thankful, the psalmist was thankful for the forgiveness that God grants. That's something that doesn't fade away. That's something that's permanent, the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross of Calvary, that God Almighty in his righteousness looks at my unrighteousness and forgives me. He forgives me because I've accepted the the payment that Jesus Christ made. That is something that is permanent. That's something that is factual. That's something that is rock solid. And so no matter my current situation, no matter the trials I may be going through, no matter how I feel about something, no matter what my day may be going, whether it's a good day, a bad day, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad. Yesterday I was, I was working for a while in the, in the afternoon and I did the proverbial hammer to finger. Boy, that thing, it's my... Fingernail right now is all black, you know. It throbbed all night. But I'm glad that my... I'm glad that my heart condition is not tied to how I feel. Because I may not have been super happy when I hit my finger with a hammer yesterday. One, it hurt. And two, I felt like an idiot. You know what I mean? I clearly missed what I was aiming for, you know. So you feel dumb and then you hurt on top of that. Aren't you glad that our relationship with the Lord and our heart of joy and gratitude is not tied, shouldn't be tied, to temporal things, to how I'm feeling about something, to the situation I'm in, to the the place that I'm at in life. Those things are going to come and go. Those things are going to change all the time. They change daily. They can change very, very quickly. But they can be tied to things that are rock solid. And the psalmist here in Psalm 103 thanks God for forgiving all thine iniquities. And so here's here's my premise today. Here's my plan today as we're heading up to Thanksgiving. As we're talking on on a national level, we're talking about being thankful and grateful. As Christians and believers, we should ever more be thankful and have so much more to be thankful for. So as we're coming to Thanksgiving week and talking about gratitude, Psalm 100 tells us, enter into his courts with thanksgiving, with praise, be thankful unto him. What type of things should I be thankful for? What are those things? Yes, I can be thankful for those temporal things that God has given me at this point in my life. But they're temporal. My health is maybe good today, it may be gone tomorrow. My situation, my job, my vocation, my, my, my relationships. Good today, they could be gone tomorrow. I can't, I can't hinge everything upon that. What type of thing should I be thankful for? Here's the proper protocol. Come before God in thanksgiving. And so I'm challenging you as you come before the Lord and have your time of devotions, if you have your, your time of prayer, as you pray for the thanksgiving meal, and hopefully pray many times between now and then. What type of things are we thankful for? And it's going to be easy to be thankful, listen, for the physical things. But we're going to see a pattern here. We're going to look real quick, not only at this psalm, but at some things Jesus said and some things Paul said. They're going to be permanent things, unchanging, unwavering things. So even if my situation is not as good, these things don't change. David was thankful that God forgave iniquities. David understands that, right? At various points in David's life, he messed up. The glaring example, the sin with Bathsheba, but there were other ones as well where he didn't do the way, things the way he was supposed to be doing when he counted the people when he wasn't supposed to be doing that and some other things where his relationship with God hit a, a roadblock. He was thankful that God forgave. 
forgave his sins, forgave him when he messed up, that God's not a once and done God. That God didn't come along and say, well, that's it. You know, I'm done with you. I'm moving on. No, he forgives us and has an, an opportunity there for us to find um, uh, forgiveness in spite of our sins, in spite of our responses, in spite of the things we do. He forgives us. Verse number four. David said, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and with tender mercies. I think verse four, he's talking about the sufficiency of Christ. His loving kindness, his tender mercies. He'll talk about mercy several times down through this passage at the end of verse number eight. Well, the beginning of verse eight, the Lord is merciful. The end of verse eight, he's plenteous. In mercy, Verse 11, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. The psalmist was so grateful for the mercy of God that God didn't immediately snuff him out when he messed up, but was patient and understanding, had expectations, wanted him to get things right, but was merciful in spite of his own failings and his own uh, humanity and his own problems. He tells us there in verse number five, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so thy youth is renewed like the eagles. God gives that spiritual energy when we physically don't feel that. He renews and encourages and invigorates. So even when we're tired and worn and hurting physically, our spirit, our soul is renewed and encouraged because of who he is. I'm telling you, not just the physical or the temporal, but the spiritual and the eternal. Let's look at the example of Jesus Christ. Um, We'll go over to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. It's a parallel passage we look at each Sunday that we remember the Lord's Supper, the first Sunday of each month. We're just looking at the life of Jesus. There's I have three examples this morning of things that he was thankful for. Uh, chapter 26 and verse number 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, break it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. That's the verses obviously we use in our communion service. Verse 27, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. We see in this passage, we see also in corresponding passage like Luke 24, that he gave thanks for the bread and he gave thanks for the cup. Think about that. Well, that's, that's, we're, we're familiar with that because we incorporate that into our monthly communion service. And so we, of course, are thankful for the body and the blood of Christ that was shed. But Jesus thanked God for that. And listen, it was going to be his body and his blood. It was going to be his life that was given for mankind. It was going to be his own, you know, in the, the humanity side of Jesus Christ, he bore the bruises and the abuse and ultimately the physical death that went into paying for our sins. Spiritually, of course, he took the load of sin upon his shoulders from all humanity, from all time. But physically, he was going to endure all that, and it was Jesus Christ who, in the uh, introduction of how to remember him on the cross of Calvary, as he introduced the communion service as we know it, the Lord's Supper, as he introduced how to do that and how to remember and what it's about, he thanked God for the body that was broken. It would be his body. 
and the blood that was shed, and it would be his blood. He was thankful for that. How about this one, John chapter 11? John chapter 11. It's another uh, passage. Brother Walker looked at this in Sunday school this morning. But in um, verse 41... This is the story of uh, Lazarus being raised from the dead. In verse number 41, we're at the end of that story. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Then begins the rest of that uh, um, discourse that we're so familiar with. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Isn't it interesting? Before he said the words, Lazarus, come forth, before that, he said, I am so thankful that you heard me. We would have done that in the opposite order, right? Not that we had the power to say, Lazarus, come forth. But in our our humanity, we would have said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he comes forth, say, Lord, I'm so thankful you heard me. Jesus, in ultimate faith and understanding of the situation, of course, as the divine nature that he has, he said, God, I'm so thankful you heard me. And then he issues the command for Lazarus. To come forth. I I think that's something we can relate very much to. You and I, in the midst of the communion service, are, I believe, as thankful as we can be for the bread and the cup, for the body and the blood of Christ that was broken for us. By that, I mean it's hard for us to fully understand and comprehend all that goes into that. But we're, we're thankful for that. Here in verse number 41, I think we see something that maybe is more relatable for us when it comes to being thankful like Jesus was. I, Jesus had a whole different perspective on being thankful for the bread and the cup. But here he said, God, I'm thankful that you hear us. That you hear us. That's for you and me. Right? That, I mean, he even talked about that in verse 42, that he was saying some of the things he was saying for the people that were around that didn't really believe or didn't understand or didn't really know who he was. They didn't understand his divine nature. Aren't you glad God hears us? I have incorporated that into some of my praying when I pray here at church or some of my teaching. God's He's not only a prayer answering God, but he's a prayer hearing God. He hears us when we pray. Isn't it good to know that God Almighty has an open ear to the needs of mankind, to the request of mankind? He hears us. God Almighty, there's, there's what, seven plus billion people in this world. Not all of whom are praying, not all of whom are believers, but... Think of the multitudes that are, and yet our prayers are not unheard. They are most clearly heard. You fire off a letter to your congressman. You call the White House and leave a message, which there's an opportunity to do so. Your congressman may not ever see that letter. And I guarantee the president's never going to hear your message, you know. We open our hearts in prayer before God. He hears us. We may not get the answer we want. We understand that, right? We may not always see, the, see everything from the right perspective and understand all of what God's doing. We may not always get the answer we're looking for. But we have a guarantee that he hears us when we pray. There, we could have sin in our heart that's, that's inhibiting that. We understand that. There may be a problem in our life we need to fix, but that's on us, not on him. 
If we get things right in our life and we continue and have an open prayer life and confess sin as sin enters our life, we are guaranteed the fact that he hears us when we pray. Isn't that a blessing? What a, what a great thing. Jesus pointed that out. Here he is at the scene of Lazarus who died. He's about to be raised from the dead. Listen, that seems like the main event, right? That's the main thing that's going on here. This miraculous event Someone dead, coming back to life. But in the midst of that, Jesus said, here's an important lesson for you. God, I thank you that you hear when we pray. That we have that open communication. Paul has a couple. Let's look at them real quick. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Just some things Paul mentioned that he was thankful for. In chapter 1, verse 8, we see Paul being thankful for other people, other servants of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. Paul says, I'm so thankful for other believers, for their testimony, for their work, for their service, for their faithfulness. I'm thankful for other believers. Again, my... Let's back up. My, my goal here this morning is to give us some things from Scripture to be thankful for. Thankfulness is the proper protocol to come before God. We have an opportunity to pray. We're supposed to come in praise and thanksgiving. What type of things should we be thankful for? Paul tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 8, he was thankful for other believers, for their faithfulness, for their testimony for the life that they live, for them being faithful in their service to God. 1 Corinthians 15. There, there's a bunch, and we're only going to look at a couple this morning. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57. I'm going to start in verse 54. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory through him. Victory over death. Through him, I don't have to face death as an ominous thing, as an end, as a finality. I can, as a believer in Jesus Christ, I can face death knowing I have victory over sin and death because of Jesus Christ. If I put my faith and trust in Christ, I will live with him forever. My soul does not die. My soul will spend eternity with him. Without him, my soul also does not die, but it will spend eternity in a lake of fire. Thanks be to God that he gave us victory over that, that we have a hope that endures, that we have a promise that is true. Thanks be to God. We want something to be thankful for. I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I remember over the last number of years, I made sure that every day I thanked God for my salvation. And I've changed that recently. Lord, I thank God that salvation is available to all. Not just me. Thank you for saving my soul. But thank you so much that the plan of salvation is available to everyone. To all. To anyone that believeth. Be so thankful for the, the work, the finished work of Christ upon Calvary. The, what he did. And victory over death. That doesn't have to be that dark cloud that hangs over our head. 2 Corinthians. Let's look at one more. 2 Corinthians chapter 9.
2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, the very last verse of the chapter. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. For Jesus Christ. For redemption. For all the things we just talked about. I, I, I was making a number of notes there. But how about just being thankful for the grace that he gives? Paul understood that. At least Paul um, wrote about that. Paul was given those instructions. And Paul was working on that, I think, in his own life. The Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I began to understand that more and more over the last couple of years. He gives us the grace we need when we need it. Not before. I mean, we'd like that. We would like to be able to take grace and have it and put it right there on the shelf so when I need it, it's right here. But the promise is, I will give you the grace you need to go through the situation when you get there. Here's an example of that. I was thinking of this the, the other day. Uh, before I was pastor here at Cedar Hill, I taught the um, young married couples class at my previous church. And we had a pretty good sized class. There was probably, on an average Sunday morning, maybe 30 people or so in that Sunday school class. So 15, 16 couples in that class. And... Um, I was a little older than the rest of them in there. And um, Desi and I uh, got, had gotten married young, and so we had kids young. So we, I was way ahead of everybody else in that part of my life. And so here's couples in there. They're just starting their careers. They're thinking about having kids or just having children. And, and so I'm, I'm giving examples, illustrations of things that I'm dealing with, with with my kids. My kids are in school. My kids are growing up. My kids are dealing with whatever you know, kids were dealing with at that time. I'm giving these examples, and one of the, one of the young couples came up, and, and they're like, they haven't had children yet. And they're like, I, it was scaring them, right? The, the idea of having children was scary to them. Like, oh, I don't, know if, I don't know if we can do that, and I don't know how I will handle that. And I said, wait a minute. God doesn't give you a teenager. You know? <laughs> Thank goodness, you know. He gives you a, an infant, and then, and then you grow with that infant. And the next thing you know, it doesn't take long, the next thing you know, you have a teenager, you know. But you're growing into that. God, God gives you what you can handle at the time of, of where you're at in your life. And you have the opportunity to grow with that. And I, th I think we see that with things like grace as well. He gives us the grace we need to deal with the situation at hand. I mean, you, some of us, maybe at, at, at my age or younger than me, we look at someone who has maybe just lost their spouse. We're like, wow, how do, you, how do you handle that? Well, God gives you the grace necessary to do that when you find yourself on that road, when you find yourself in that situation. God gives us the grace to be able to handle that bad news from the doctor's office or that loved one whose health is failing or that child who's going through a difficulty. He gives us the grace to handle that in the midst of the situation. It's something to be so thankful for. Not to sit there and worry like, I don't know how I'll handle that if. Well, God, God will give us what we need when we're there. Don't worry about that now. These are things to be thankful for. Paul learned so many of these lessons in his life and is sharing them to us through his epistles. I have a number here. In 1 Timothy, he talks about being so thankful that God used him in ministry. That he was, God allowed him to be a vessel used in the midst of the work of God. Something I thank God every day for in my prayer life. God, I'm so thankful you're allowing me to be a minister of the gospel. There's many reasons why not, but God uses me in spite of them. So thankful for where God has put me and what God has allowed to happen. Listen, we're going to come 
to Thanksgiving week and that opportunity is going to be there and you're going to hear people being thankful for whatever. I, I think we find in our culture today so many of those are, are temporal things. We have so much to be thankful for that God has given us. And as we come in that proper protocol in prayer before God, if we start to make a list and start to outline the things that we are truly thankful for, our prayer life would get rather extensive. So thankful for what God has done. So thankful for what he has given, for what he has offered, for the way that he works, whether it's personal or much, much bigger than me. We want to have a heart of gratitude. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time we've had today, for the opportunity to be gathered together this week, Lord, as we're preparing for Thanksgiving week, where we have an opportunity to to be thankful. Lord, Psalm 100 gave us that that, uh, that, uh, 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 principle there. Come before you with thanksgiving and with praise. Lord, let us be thankful, not just for the things that you have given us or for the, the moments that you have given us, but for the things that are eternal the things that are forever, the things that are, are, are the attributes of God which have allowed us to have hope and an eternity with you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for giving his life on Calvary for the expense and the, 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 the debt of our sin. Lord, we thank you that we can find forgiveness and hope and cleansing.